that phrase in the chant just now, those who don't discern suffering. It sounds strange. You'd think that everybody would know when they're suffering. But even on the blatant level, that's not always the case. People sometimes get a very tunnel vision about what they're doing and what they're experiencing, and they don't see what they're doing, and they don't understand that the way they're focused on something, the way they're obsessed with something, is causing them a lot of suffering, even as they may gain what they think they want. But even when we begin to see that we're causing ourselves pain, we can't really say that we discern suffering. Look at the first noble truth. The Buddha talks about the suffering of birth, aging, illness, and death, the suffering of not getting what you want, the suffering of being what you don't, with, with what you don't like, of being separated from what you do like, the suffering of sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair. Those are all things we know. But in John Lee's terminology, those are the shadows of suffering. The real suffering is the Buddha's analysis at the end, the five clinging aggregates. And that's not all that obvious. But if you really want to discern suffering, that's what you've got to see, that wherever the mind is suffering, there are clinging aggregates. You can't have one without the other. So you have to learn to ferret out where you're clinging, what you're holding on to, wherever there's suffering. Where's the clinging and what exactly you're clinging to? It's usually a feeling or a perception or fabrication. Those tend to be the big ones. And it's hard to see when we're clinging to these things. On top of that, there are different kinds of clinging. You cling to some things because they give sensual pleasure or they promise sensual pleasure. You cling to other things simply out of habit. You cling to views that you've got, and you cling through your sense of who you are. So it's a fairly technical discussion the Buddha gives of what the real suffering is. And so only when you see that, that you're clinging to these activities, the aggregates are activities, then you can start thinking about what's causing you to do that. That's when you begin to see the second noble truth. And as Buddha said, it's any kind of craving that leads to becoming. But you can be craving for sensuality, craving for a particular becoming, but, and ironically, craving for non-becoming. In other words, you, just, you find yourself in a particular state, and you don't like it, and you want to destroy it. That way you take on the identity of a destroyer. So you've been in the craving for non-becoming, they're still becoming. Now the way we see these things is through developing the path. So eventually we can realize the end of the craving, and thus the end of the suffering. So altogether there are four duties, comprehending the suffering to the point where you see that it really is the five clinging aggregates, and you see those activities in action to the point where you develop dispassion. Try to abandon the cause of that suffering. You do it through developing the path so you realize the end of suffering. It sounds like four separate duties, but they all go together. Because you can't comprehend suffering until you've developed the path to some extent. And ironically, you can't develop the path until you've learned how to be aware of when you pull out of a particular craving. In other words, you notice you're going off someplace off the path and you pull yourself out of that. That pulling yourself out, that's the activity of letting go of a particular craving and a particular clinging. We often don't notice ourselves doing that. We're doing it all the time, usually though without noticing it because we're intent on the next craving, the next state of becoming. 
But here's you pull yourself back to the past. You have a chance to see, oh, this is how I got in there and this is how I get out. You see a little moment of dispassion there. So all these duties are interrelated. In fact, as you get closer and closer to awakening, John Munn says that all four truths and all four duties turn into one. Even Dogen, writing in the Zen tradition, trying to explain what you read sometimes in some Mahayana texts, that the path is the goal. He says that's not quite right. It's the activity of developing the path is the same as the activity of realizing the goal. The two duties go together. But even when you're not toward the end of the path, knowing that these duties are interrelated can give you a lot of assistance when you find that you can't figure anything out in your mind. In other words, you can't comprehend where the suffering is or you can't comprehend where the cause is. The way to go about getting more comprehension there is to develop a path. This is getting the mind to settle down. That allows you to see things more clearly. The reason we don't see things usually comes down to, one, either we can't see them or two, we won't see them. In other words, one, our powers of perception are not sharp enough, or two, they're sharp enough but we don't like what we see, so we turn our eyes away. And developing mindfulness, developing concentration helps you to overcome both of those problems. In other words, as the mind settles down and is more still, more solid, it's in a better position so it can actually see things where it can see things. And given the sense of well-being that comes when you're with, say, the breath, and it's really comfortable, and you learn how to develop a sense of ease that you can spread through the body, and you get a sense of confidence in your skill in concentration, the mind is a lot less likely to be shaken by the things it sees. That helps to overcome your, the problem where you won't see them. You find yourself more and more willing to see them. And getting the mind into concentration, you're actually beginning to see what those aggregates are. Aggregates sound like pieces of gravel. They're not. They're, they're activities. And when you're creating a state of concentration, you're engaged in these activities. You've got the form, which is your breath. You've got feeling, which is either the feelings of pain in the body or the feelings of ease that you try to develop as you stay with the breath. There's the perception you hold in mind, the mental label or the mental image you hold to help you with the breath. There's fabrication, by your, the way you think about the breath and talk to yourself about the breath. And there's consciousness of these things. So as you get the mind into concentration, you get more and more acquainted with these five activities. So they're not just abstractions. You begin to realize this is how you go about creating states of mind. And when you can see them, then you're in a much better position to notice when you're clinging to them or how you're clinging to them. That's one way in which developing the path helps you to comprehend suffering. The other, of course, is that ability to pull out of a distraction. We like to think that if the mind attained a really solid state of concentration, just stayed there, that would take care of all the problems. But that's not the point. The point is when you slip off that concentration a bit, if you've really been well concentrated, you can see this is the process of how the mind slips off and this is how the process of the mind pulls itself out. Which is why when the mind gets distracted, don't just treat it with frustration, treat it with care. Because it's showing you the workings of the mind. You know, if it's in that little bit of distraction that important insights arise. This is why John Sawat used to say that walking meditation is really good for developing discernment. Because you have to be with the breath at the same time you're aware of the world outside. You begin to see the mind 
moving back and forth between the world of the breath and the world outside. And it's in detecting those little movements that you can see the processes of how craving creates the clinging that leads to the suffering. And how seeing through that helps to pull you out of that craving and clinging. So remember that the four duties that go with the Four Noble Truths are interconnected. You can't do one without doing the others. And if you find yourself running up against a brick wall and trying to do one of them, look at which other ones that you're neglecting. That'll help you get past the wall. <laughs>